It is resurrection weekend, and uh, you may not understand everything about the res resurrection. You may not understand everything about God, but uh, I hope today that you will encounter the resurrection power of Christ. Three fellows showed up in heaven one day, and, and Peter was standing at the gate, and he didn't know if he should let them in. And three of them lined up, and Peter said, fellas, I'm going to have to give you some questions before I can let you in. Um, and it's going to be about Jesus. You need to tell me something about Jesus. Uh, first guy took off. He said, I got that. He said, uh, uh, Jesus, um, isn't that the, um, the heavyset fellow in the red suit that gives away gifts every Christmas time? And Peter said, you got to stand down next. Second guy comes in, oh, no, no, he's, he, he's that, he's that uh, green, uh, dressed up like a leprechaun kind of guy in March, and if you don't wear green, he's going to get pinched. And all. Peter said, you better step aside, boy. Third guy came up and said, I got this, I got this. Jesus, yeah, he, he, he did a lot of miracles on the earth, and uh, yeah, they, they, uh, they crucified him. Peter said, come on, boy, come on. They, they, they crucified him, he died for our sins, and and um, he was supposed to rise on the third day, but he poked his head out and saw it was bad weather. And he said, it was going to be seven weeks of bad weather, so he never came back. That'd be the groundhog fella. I think that a lot of people don't understand the fact that the entire Bible hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The entirety of it all. Now, I'm going to help you with the resurrection story. I hope you can get it a little clearer than the Groundhog Day. But um, uh, there was a guy in the Bible that uh, showed up when Jesus died. His name was Thomas. He was called Doubting Thomas because he always questioned everything. And, and he, he said, I will not believe until I touch his scars in his side. I won't believe. And, and, and he said, I need more facts. I need, I need a lot more stuff to tell me that Jesus is really real. And, um, but the problem is not that, Thomas. The problem of the resurrection is not a head problem. It's a heart problem. You can, we can lay down all the information we can to you. We could, we could show you that it's been a historically proven fact that Jesus rose from the grave. Uh, just so, Josephus and other historical writers have proven that Jesus rose from the grave. Billions and billions of people around the world today are celebrating the fact that he rose from the dead. But I want to go a little different angle today because I... I want to I wanna go for the heart, not so much the head, because I think that people need to experience a heart relationship with God. Because you may not have all the answers about God, but there's something in your heart that you know, that you know, that you know, that you got a God in heaven above, he's got a son named Jesus, and there's, everything's going to be all right because he's coming back to get us one of these days. Somebody say amen. Amen. I want to talk to you about grave clothes, and I want to read you these verses here out of John chapter 11. We're going to read a couple of verses. Did everybody get a program guide? We got some that we can hand out to you. If you'd like one, just sort of wave at us. The ushers will make their way down uh, if you want one. Uh, this is the verses that appear in there. The Bible said in John chapter 11, we're going to take the story of Lazarus. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead before he raised himself from the dead. So we're going to look at this story first. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises on that last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Can you read this part with me? I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Isn't that a good verse? Yes. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I've always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. <clears throat> Somebody say, thank God for his word. 
Jesus has gone up north somewhere, probably 40, maybe 60 miles away from where he's supposed to be at the Bethany house. I say supposed to be because there is a problem in the Bethany house. Lazarus, his sister Mary and Martha, they live in Bethany and there's a problem that, if, that has literally come to their house and Pastor Jesus is a long ways away, a long ways away. You know, it's one thing for you and I to encounter problems in a distant land. We hear about the problems in the Ukraine today, in uh, Iran or wherever we hear, and, and those are problems way off in a distant land. But then we hear a problem comes into America and it comes to our own country. And we're still concerned, but it's, you know, it's, it's still not here. And then we hear a problem will come even to our own city and we'll be concerned. Uh, but, but, it, but what happened here, the problem came to their house. And it's a problem is different when it comes to your house than when it's out in the Ukraine or when it's over in Boston or somewhere. This problem is, has come to the house and they can't run from it now. We can run from all the other problems because it never came onto our house. But we have a problem right here. Lazarus, Lazarus is dying and they can't find Jesus. Jesus, however, is not going to show up because Jesus needs Lazarus to die for him. These sisters did not know that. But what you will understand as you read the scriptures, you'll figure out this, this, this had to happen and it's happening in the Bethany house. It is there. It's in the house and the problem with it being in the house is you cannot run from yourself. How many of you know you cannot run from yourself? <laughs> and oh, the problem is here. I could talk about it when it was someone else's problem, but, but it's here and, and <clears throat> Jesus is gone and, and Martha and, and Mary are talking to uh, Lazarus. Uh, now this is not just any house. This is not uh, some religious house that say, yeah, we named the Lord our Savior. We never go to church or anything. No, 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 no. These were all in people. This, this is the Bethany house. This is not a religious house. This is a major house of faith. These are the people's house you go to when you got a problem. You know, these people are praying people. This right here is the Bethany house. It, it is not a religious house. And Pastor Jesus is 40 miles away and Lazarus is dying. Lazarus, Lazarus, <coughs> Martha whispers to him, Lazarus, you got to hold on. You got to hold on, Lazarus. Don't give up, Lazarus. Pastor Jesus is going to be here any time now. Lazarus, Lazarus, don't you die on me, Lazarus. Jesus is on his way. Lazarus, Lazarus, Lazarus. And all of a sudden, Lazarus breathes his last breath. He's a young man, too young to die. And Jesus is nowhere to be found. Hmm. No miracle. And we were serving God with our whole house. What do you do? You know, I always testify, testify about the goodness of the Lord. I always testify about how God comes through and how God works a miracle. But what do you do? When there's no answer, what do you do when there's no miracle? It is late in the midnight hour and you don't have a clue what happened to God. What do you do when you've done all you could do and there is still no miracle? I thought if I believed in God, I could see a miracle. I thought if I believed in God, this would not happen to me. I heard of a tragic situation this week. I was hanging out with a couple of pastors and one pastor said, that a young lady had died in his uh, city and they weren't going to church and a young girl had died and the pastor went over to the lady's house who had lost her daughter and, and he goes up to the door and, and the lady didn't know him and he just introduced himself and said, I'm pastor so-and-so and I've come here to tell you I'm so sorry that you lost your daughter and, and I just want to let you know that I'm praying for you 
our church is praying for you. God loves you. And the woman said, you get off my porch now. Get away from my house, preacher. You can't tell me about a God because I needed him to show up three or four days ago. Get away from me. Where was your God when I needed him? As a pastor, you spend your entire life, you feel like you have to defend Jesus a lot of times because Jesus doesn't show up when we want him to show up. And you come with words, well, we got to keep on praying, we got to keep on believing because we know all things work together for the good. But Jesus, where are you, man? You could have at least sent one of your boys down there. Oh, even Doubting Thomas would have done. I mean, Jesus, where are you? If you couldn't show up, why didn't you just send somebody over here? And as a pastor, I get caught in these dilemmas all the time. I'm his representative on the earth. And, and sometimes it is hard telling people why Jesus didn't show up. And I think it's very crucial to what people do when Jesus doesn't show up because it causes us to have to have faith like we never had before. Ah, but how many of you know that Jesus always shows up? Yes. Jesus always shows up. He does. He does. But he didn't show up here at this funeral. He didn't show up at the Lazarus house. He didn't show up at the Bethany house. He didn't show up anywhere. He didn't come to the funeral. He was four days later and Jesus shows up at Lazarus house. And I'm telling you, the people are not happy. Where were you, Jesus? And where are you now, Jesus? I thought you were going to come and deliver me. I thought you, you would have come and I thought I would have been married by now, Jesus. I thought if I served you, you would have showed up in this area of my life. You would have showed up in my business. Come on, Jesus. Have you ever been through something and you couldn't figure out what God was doing? Two of us? Come on. <laughs> have you ever been mad at God? Like the lady told the preacher, get off my porch. I don't need him now. I needed him earlier. And I'm, Jesus, the funeral is over. And you show up now and, and Jesus, I've cried so much for Lazarus. My tear ducts are dry. Um, Jesus, why? Where have you been? The Bible said that when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he waited around two more days. If you want to read some Bible, read the whole chapter of John 11. This is one of the most fascinating stories in all of John's writing. Matter of fact, if you're new to Christianity, I would, I would suggest you just pick up the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just read John. And when you get to John 11, this is an amazing story because Lazarus is actually the game changer for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the tripwire. Lazarus was the last straw because people were looking to kill Jesus. Matter of fact, Jesus' disciples did not want to come back down there around Jerusalem because they knew people were looking for them. They didn't know, want to get anywhere cl uh, close to it. But when Jesus knew in his mind, when I go down there and I raise Lazarus from the dead, it is a sign to all the haters that Put to, they can put things in motion. It's a sign to all the religious people that hate me that they can get the crucifixion started. This was the tripwire to put the cross in motion, but Martha and Mary know nothing about that. So Jesus shows up and he comes to Martha and he has a conversation. He talks to Mary and Jesus said to Martha the same thing he would say to us today, take me Take me where you have laid him. Where did you put Lazarus? Take me there. Show me the place that you gave up. Show me the place where your faith gave up. I cannot do a miracle until you lead me to the place where your faith gave up. I think a lot of us, if we look back on our lives and the times that we walked away from God, it was a moment when we quit believing in God. Take me back. Take, where have you laid Lazarus? Take me there. Take me to the spot where you got tired and you said, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Take me to the place where you thought 
I didn't care anymore. So they walk him out to the graveyard. They take him over to the tomb. They have rolled a, a stone across Lazarus' tomb and it is closed up. And then listen to what Jesus prays. Jesus gets in front of this tomb and he prayed, he whispered a prayer to God. He said, I know you always hear me, but because of those people around me, I thank you, Lord, that you're going to hear me again. And he didn't bring a bottle of anointing oil like they did in the Old Testament. He steps up to that grave and he calls Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, why did he have to call his name? Because if he would have said, come forth, maybe all of those graves would have popped open. But he said, Lazarus, come forth. There was a lot of people. He had to step over their graves to get, you sure this is Lazarus? Because when I speak the, the rising up, this guy's going to come out of that grave. And he did. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. Now you got to get the picture here. Lazarus has been mummified. Lazarus has been wrapped up with these grave clothes and he is just, I don't know how he got out of there because he's bound up, his face is wrapped up, his arms are tied down, his feet are probably together. How did he get out of there? Is that where the Easter bunny came from? Did he do the bunny hop? I don't know. How, how did he do that? But here's another thing that I wonder. Martha said, Jesus, uh, he stinks by now. Don't even be fooling with that corpse. He's been dead four days. Hmm, he stinketh now. Don't touch him, Jesus. He stinks. I love Jesus right here because we serve a God who won't let the stink stop him. Aren't you glad that your stinky situation can't stop the Lord? Aren't you glad that whatever mess you got yourself into, I'm telling you, he'll come and talk to you about things you don't even want to talk about. What you've been doing about that self-defeating habit you got yourself into. I mean, he'll come right down in the middle of all of that and he will want to talk to you because he wants you to be delivered. Who told you you were too far gone for God to help you? Who told you that you could not be delivered? Lazarus comes out of there. Somehow he gets out of there. I assume that he's on his knees just bumping along or something. And Jesus says these incredible words. Because Lazarus is still wrapped up in his clothes. Someone's got to remove his clothes off of him. And he said, somebody get those grave clothes off that boy. Now, I don't know about you, but I would not be the first one to volunteer. <laughs> this man has been dead for four days. And I don't know if, about you, but sometimes I get to squeamies when I get around dead people. Jesus said, take those gray clothes. Really, Lord? Are you really talking about? So they start taking them out. And imagine you are unwrapping this man. <sighs> oh, man. I mean, this is worse than being in the toilet when somebody went in there. I mean, this is, this is the smell of death. I mean, this is, this is getting bad and it's getting, oh, it's, it's, but as I looked at that this week, I thought, you know, some of the people I'm dealing with right now, they've gotten themselves in some pretty stinky situation. And it's even hard sometimes to be around them because I want to just slap them upside the head and say, why don't you straighten up? But the Lord says, no, why don't you get in the stink with me and try to unwrap some of those people that have gotten themselves in some stinky situation. Where are the people who are willing to get dirty to help some people that got themselves wrapped up in something they shouldn't have gotten themselves wrapped up in? <laughs> so finally they unwind him, unwind him. He couldn't walk his way out. He couldn't talk his way out. Lazarus came out, but he was still bound. I want you to think about that. Who are the people around you that are still bound? The people that you've given up on. The people that you said, you know what, uh, you, another year of your addiction, I'm done with your alcoholism. I'm done with your drug addict. I'm done with you doing all that you're doing. I, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. I'm done with you. Aren't you glad that Jesus never said, I'm done with you? <clears throat> Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't give up on you? Aren't you glad that some people didn't give up on you? Now, Lazarus is free 
on the inside. He's got his life back, but he's bound on the outside. You know, you can love Jesus with all your heart and still have a self-defeating habit in your life. I mean, you can love Jesus and be shooting up. I had a friend one time, he was shooting up dope in his arm and a preacher came across the television and said these very words, I see you, Mr. Dope Addict. God loves you with all of his heart. He pulled that needle out. He fell to his knees and he got born again and went to be a preacher. I'm telling you, God won't let the stink stop him. He won't let it. <laughs> He just needs, and here's the power of it all. Jesus brought him out with the power of God. Jesus got him back to life, but he gave us the assignment of getting the grave clothes off of the people that are around us that are too bound. They can't get themselves unbound. And I'm telling you, you may be that person here listening to me today. You look around your own life and you say, Pastor, Everything around me is dead. My marriage is dead. My finances are dead. My relationship to my family is dead. Everything is dead. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, but he also can raise you out of your dead situation. And Jesus has got some people hanging around that could help you. <coughs> Jesus said, take those grave clothes off of him. I want you to write this one down because grace, here's where grace comes in. Grace can get anyone out of their grave clothes. I don't know if you know about grace. I don't know if you really know about grace. I know a well-known preacher, if I were to call his name, half of you would know him, but he went through a time in his life where he just backslid. He had gotten into some church problems with some church people and church people were saying nasty things about the preacher so he just gave up. He said, I'm going to go to Hawaii and just, just be on the beach, a beach bum. And sure enough, he did. He wasn't married. He went to Hawaii. He just living like a bum on the beach and he's walking down the beach one day and just being a bum, haven't served the Lord in a while, and all of a sudden, another preacher from America runs into him and he recognized him and he said, hey, where have you been? And then this preacher started crying that found the beach bum preacher. He started crying. He said, you know what? I've, I don't know why I was on this beach today, but I feel like God was going to lead me to someone to tell them that they need to come back. My friend, that's the way grace is. Grace will send somebody to a weird place to bring you back because God is not willing that you perish, but that all come back to God. There's a verse in Ephesians that says that God lavishes his grace upon us. God lavishes grace upon us. And I, I want you to understand that because mm, this word uh, uh, lavish means superfluitous. It means to go beyond measure. If you, if you have 10, it means to go on to 11. If you have 25, it means to go on to 26. And this is that word. God lavishes his grace. God will go beyond what anybody else would go. God will say, you know, you've gotten yourself in a pretty bad fix. I'm telling you, grace will walk into a bar when you're getting drunk and grace will belly up to the bar with you and flirt with you and make you feel like it's okay to come back home. That's my God. My God is filled with grace. You can do anything. You can go anywhere. <coughs> you can be in prison right now. But my God is saying, by grace, I love you. I got a better spot for you. I got a better plan for you. If you would just let grace, the psalmist said it right in Psalm 139. He said, where shall I go from your spirit, Lord? How can I hide from your presence? If I go and make my home above the clouds, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I go to the other side of the ocean, you are there there. Ladies and gentlemen, you have not gone too far that my God is not reaching out to you and saying, come home, come home, come home. It's time. I've got a plan. I've got a hope for you. 
But who, who, not only is going to get out of their graves, but who are going to be the people that helps others get out of their grave clothes? It's easy to judge people, isn't it? Well, if that was me, I wouldn't be strung out on that dope. If that was me, I wouldn't be homeless. And if that was me, and, and I still wouldn't be making those poor choices. Uh, why are you still addicted? Why, why, why are you still doing crazy things? Ladies and gentlemen, people don't need people to judge them. You know, the older that I get, the less judgment I have. Because except for the grace of God, that could have been me. Because I was raised in a halfway decent house. I was raised in a great country, and if they had been given what I had been given, maybe they would have had a better chance to serve the Lord. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, it's not time for any of us to judge anybody for what they've gotten themselves into. It's time for us to start trying to help unwrap some people that have gotten themselves bound up. You're bound up. The religious people brought a woman in John chapter 8 and they threw this woman at the feet of Jesus. They had caught her in adultery with another man. I don't know where the man is. But they throw the woman down there and they said, Jesus, our law says stone her to death. Jesus didn't say anything. Jesus starts writing something in the sand. One commentator said, I think he started writing their names down in the sand of the fellows that were there. Jesus, Jesus, what do you want to do with this woman? They all had rocks in her hands. Let's kill her. She's a sinner according to Moses' law. If you understand anything about Jesus, Jesus came to destroy that attitude right there. And he said these words, you without sin, you cast the first stone. The Bible said they started dropping those rocks. They dropped them all. They dropped them all. Finally, there was no men left, only Jesus and the woman. Jesus looked up and said, Woman, neither do I condemn thee. Go thy way. Try to do better. Isn't that the God that we all serve? Isn't that the God who gets us out of our graves, helps us get our grave clothes off? Huh. <clears throat> the Pharisees, had made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rules. By the time the New Testament opens up, they had made hundreds. They, they had 600, they take Moses' 10 commandments and they had added, and they had enlarged it to 622 laws. And man, you couldn't, you couldn't move a piece of furniture across the, your, your floor on the Sabbath. You couldn't walk outside on the Sabbath. You couldn't do all kinds of things. I mean, you... You, you couldn't do it. Jesus came to destroy the works of religion. He came to destroy what man had put together. And Jesus summed up the entire Bible in these two verses. He said, love God and love others. You want to know what Jesus is all about? It's summed up in those two words, four words. Love God, love others. Somebody say, love God. Love others. Let me finish this verse with you. I'm coming in for a landing. John chapter 20. Now this is when Jesus is being resurrected. Now Lazarus got out of his grave, but now as soon as they found out, as soon as Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, all the religious people and the townspeople got together and they drew up a plan. We got to kill this guy now. Why did they kill him? They said because of his miraculous power. If he, we keep allowing Jesus to go on and he keeps doing those miracles, we're going to lose all of our financial support. We got to kill him now. And so it was Lazarus that, that caused Jesus' crucifixion to be set in motion. And Jesus, they crucified him for what he did. But now early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. Then she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken my Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. 
Then Simon Peter came along behind him, went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as he went, as well as the cloth that was wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in his place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Jesus had to rise from the dead. You may say, I don't understand it. Just like Martha and Mary didn't understand why Jesus waited four days to come down there. They had no clue that he was going to head to the cross when he raised Lazarus. That was the last straw that broke the, broke the camel's back. So you know that God is doing things in your life, in my life. We don't have a clue what he's doing. We, and I, I came to this conclusion a long time ago. I don't have to have all the answers. I just got to have a relationship with Christ. I got to have an ongoing relationship with God. I just got to believe. I just got to believe. So what do you believe? Mary was the first one who ran to the tomb. She was the first one to see. And oh, Peter. Peter ran over to that tomb as well. Now, Peter just two days ago, three days ago, had denied the Lord. He committed the biggest sin he'd ever committed. And when Jesus raised from the dead, he told old Mary, go tell the disciples and Peter. Ladies and gentlemen, you have not done anything so bad that God can't love you and you can be in right standing with him today. He said, go tell Peter and the disciples. <laughs> but I like old John. He was a young person. He was the youngest disciple. And John looked in. And as soon as John looked in and said, I knew it. I knew he was going to do that. He said he was going to rise from the dead and he rose from the dead. Now, you may be listening to me and you say, I don't know if I believe all that, Pastor. Trust me. Trust me. Uh, <clears throat> it takes faith. But I'll tell you what. Let me give you one bit of advice. I've studied every world religion there is because I started out when I was a teenager. I didn't know what to believe. Matter of fact, I was hanging out with transcendental meditation because I like getting high and transcendentally meditate. <clears throat> I thought that was the thing for me. And then I studied Buddhism for a while. Man, that stuff is peaceful and love. Everybody just going to love, have peace. Confucius, I've studied Zoroastrianism. I studied everything. Hinduism, uh, but not one of them, not one of them. Not one of them whose founder and president ever rose from the dead. Never. None of them. None of them. None of them. I kept coming back to that one thought. Man, he rose from the dead. Not a, and then I started reading the Old Testament and said, man, this stuff was prophesied a thousand years ago he would do this. And he did it to a T. Who, who can do that? And... and if you're struggling of which faith that you want to choose, I'll put the resurrection of Jesus Christ up against anything in this entire world because no one has the power to say that I'm going to raise from the dead and do it. And because he raised from the dead, you and I can be raised as well. And he called every one of them. He said, Mary. He said, Lazarus. He called him by name, and he's calling you by name as well. And he's saying, why don't you come on out? Why don't you come out of your grave clothes? Jesus came out of his grave clothes. You can come out of yours too. And if you've hung around, and you've seen all kinds of religious things go on, and you say, I don't believe any of that stuff. No, no, don't put your, don't put your eyes on people and religion and all that junk. Karen and I were pastoring in Oceanside, California years ago, and I was sitting in my office and heard sirens go by. We were right up against Camp Pendleton in Oceanside, and we heard all of these fire trucks, these sirens go by the church, and they locked the street down, or something had happened way down the road a couple of miles, and I just started praying, and 
phone rang at the church and a lady said, Pastor, I got to talk to Pastor. They passed it in to me and, and it was Lorena. Lorena goes to our church, single gal. She said, Pastor, I don't know if you heard, but there's a wreck up the road from the church and my sister is in that car right now. And people have already died and they're telling me my sister is going to die too in that wreck. And I said, Lorena, I will go up there and pray. She said, Pastor, please don't be offended by this, but my family does not like you. I said, why not, Lorena? She said, well, Pastor, don't be offended, but they think our church is a cult. They think that our church is the devil. So, Pastor, if you could just pray at a distance. I said, okay, Lorena. So I hung the phone up, and something started bothering me. I said, no, no, that's religion talking there. That's some religious people saying they don't, they don't need religion. Uh, so I got in my car and I knew exactly where they'd take her. I went to the emergency and I followed that ambulance. And when I got there, I mean, when she was talking about a family, there were so many people there. There must have been 25 people uh, around that girl trying to get over there. And, and I was walking up and I kept hearing the voice of Lorena, my family hates you. They hate you. Don't. But I felt like God told me to go in there and pray for this girl who was hanging on to life. And so I walked up and I got the stare like, of course, there's the devil. There he is. There's that white devil. I know it's him. And I, you ever walked up and you could just feel people wanting to cut you? But I had this thing going on me. I just couldn't get shit of it. And I said, I got to go pray for that girl. I, I got to get in there. And Lorena said, you could pray at a distance, but something was telling me, you got to go pray for that girl. And so I said, Lord, they, they, they looking at me funny. He said, they looked at me funny too. Get to work. <laughs> so I stood there for a few more minutes and someone called the family down the hall a little bit. I said, thank you, Jesus. I slipped in there and the doctor says, who are you? I said, I'm pastor so-and-so. And they said, okay. I said, he said, what you gonna do? I said, I'm gonna whisper a prayer over that. He said, don't take long. So I got in there and their family, I see them coming back. I got in there and I went, this girl was tied up with every tube. She was broken, her bones were broken. She looked like death. And I whispered in her ear and I said, you will not die. You will live again. You will live and not die. And I said, baby, I don't know your name, but one day you're going to walk down the aisle of our church and we're going to celebrate together how God has completely healed your body. And here comes the family. And I'm feeling the family coming. I said, my bad, my bad. And I left the room. And about six months later, I was getting up on the pulpit and here come that girl walking down the aisle of that church, raising her hand. And she said, thank God you didn't let religion stop you, Pastor. So why do I serve God? Because the power. I mean, he'll get in your stinky stuff and what you've already given up on, he will fix it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. I want you to bow your hearts with me. I want you that are listening online, oh, don't leave me right now. You got some family members huddled around you and they need the Lord. I'm the preacher, mama's been praying for. Her. So I just want you to take a moment and say, take an inventory and find out where you are with God. Where are you with God? Where are you? If you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? If, you, if you're living life right now, do you have any power? Or is it just you and your own willpower? Oh, baby, it's more than willpower. It's supernatural spirit power. Oh, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, it can live inside of you if you would simply invite 
Jesus to be Lord of your life. If you're in this audience, you've never made a decision for Christ, you're listening on the radio, you're sitting in a jail cell, you never made a decision for Christ, I want to pray and I want to invite you to be born again. And I want to invite this power that I've been talking to you about to come into your life right now. If you're in this room and you want to get right with God, just sort of wave at me and say, that's me, Pastor. That's me. Yes, God bless you. God bless you. Yes, yes, yes. God bless you. 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 I don't know who's raising their hand at home. You don't even have to raise your hand, but I'm going to give you a prayer. It's going to start your relationship with God. And I'm telling you what he wants from you is nothing more than a conversation. Let's get the conversation started today. Let's pray this prayer. And let's get our hearts right with God right now. If you want to get right with Jesus, this is how you do it. Lord Jesus, I invite you to be Lord of my life. And from this day forward, I want to walk with God. I'm a sinner who needs saving. Please save me, Lord. You died for me. I'm going to live for you. I need help. Fill me with this power. Tell me what to do. I'm all yours. I love you, Jesus. Somebody said amen, amen, and amen.